Hello everybody, so this is the, um, I'm going to do this page that has the name on it, and first I'm going to do number one on this side. Um, there's no particular reason I'm choosing to start there. We, you should do them all, really, because they're all sort of integrated. Three Chapters three, four, and five go together. This first question is really more or less from chapter three, so we're going to go over that one first. We're supposed to write a complete reaction and total ionic and a net ionic equation for these reactions. And so the thing is that we did this in lab already, and so it shouldn't be that. It's nothing new. All right, but so our starting, let's see, we're starting with H2SO4 and K2CO3. So when writing reactions, it's really important to have states of matter because if you skip that, when you go to do the net ionic equations, it is a whole lot harder to do. Um, so I'm referring to the solubility table. You might also remember solubility rules. Either way, you'll get to the same place. Um, this has potassium in it, which is always soluble, no exceptions, so I'm going to just write AQ. This is two compounds, so I know right away it's either a combination reaction or a double replacement. Um, usually, if it's two ionic compounds, like here we got an acid and something with a metal in it, those are both ionic. Um, if that's the case, usually then I'm going to be doing a double replacement reaction, which means the cations from each piece are going to switch places. So here the K switches with the H. So in other words, it's going to be K with SO4. Um, sulfates have a minus 2 charge. I need to know that, the polyatomic groups. Um, if we know that, it's a lot easier to write the reactions. Um, so sulfate is a minus 2. And potassium on the periodic table is a plus 1. Um, so that means I need to have two of those potassiums. And again, potassium is always soluble, so I know right away that's going to be AQ. Um, and then we have a carbonate here with hydrogen. So we're a lot of people are still struggling to understand what H2 means. It's H plus, all right? So in order to be in a compound, um, hydrogen, well, in a covalent compound like an acid right here, hydrogen acts as a plus one ion. It is not the element, hydrogen, which is just H2. It's hydrogen after it loses an electron. So it's different um, than the element. So anyway, this is plus one. A carbonate is a minus two ion, so I gotta have two hydrogens here. Um, this looks like an acid. In fact, it is. It's called carbonic acid because eight becomes ic acid. So carbonate becomes carbonic acid. Um, anytime we make carbonic acid, it always undergoes a secondary reaction, which is a that's an arrow, a decomposition reaction. So carbonic acid is not particularly stable, but water and CO2 is, is extremely stable, so that's what's going to form. So our total equation, in other words, your complete balanced equation is going to look like this. Um, let's see, we have two Ks, so that's balanced. We have two Hs. There you go. Okay. So it's going to be starting with H2SO4 and K2CO3. We're going to produce the K2SO4 salt here. Every acid-base neutralization always produces a salt and water. Um, and then the H2CO3 goes away because the it's going to decompose into water and CO2. Okay, so this is a very specific um, set of reactions that happens. Anytime we have a carbonate that's reacting with something acidic, you're going to make carbonic acid and that is going to decompose. So the evidence for a chemical change would be a little bit of heat from formation of water and bubbles. Okay. Now the net ionic is what we get if we take everything that is listed as AQ and break it into the pieces that it actually exists as in water. So here um, you keep th you break up the, the ionic bonds but you keep the polyatomic bonds together. So we're going to break the hydrogen and the sulfate bond here. And when we break the hydrogen bond, it's going to break up with two H pluses. They don't stay together. They're not stuck to each other because two positively charged particles aren't going to hang out. 
the sulfate stays as a piece. Polyatomic groups stay together, which is why we kind of have to know what they are. Um, and then the K2CO3 does the same thing. You have two potassium ions and a carbonate ion. Okay, so that's what we're starting with. They're all AQ. Anything with a charge is automatically sort of <coughs> AQ. You can't really have it sitting out in the universe without being stabilized by water. So I'm not going to write it in there. I do write the charges, and they have to make sense. Like the potassium on the periodic table says plus one, so that's what I write. Um, the, the polyatomics all have kind of defined charges, so we want to keep up with that. Over here, your potassiums come apart, and your sulfate comes off, and so you get these two things. Now these are not aqueous. Water and CO2 stay exactly the same because they're not ionic things dissolved in water. They, well, then one of them is water, and the other one's not ionic. So in our net reaction, so this is your complete ionic here. The first one is just the complete <coughs> balanced reaction. This one's going to be the net ionic equation. So we're going to cancel everything that occurs on both sides. Like that. And so what we're le left with is called the net ionic equation. So we have two hydrogens, a CO3, and it produces water and CO2. So now, if I were doing Hess's law problem, <laughs> I would only... Okay, so... Um, This is our net equation. If I was doing a Hess's law problem, I would just do the net equation. I don't need to do every <coughs> little piece here. Because the net equation is actually showing what really reacted. The rest of the of the things, the things we crossed out, are called spectator ions, and they literally have no effect on the reaction. I could put anything in there. Th as long as they have the same charge, it wouldn't matter. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing here. Oh, there you go. Okay. So in the next problem, it's kind of a similar thing, uh, but instead <coughs> of reacting an acid and with a carbonate salt, we're going to be reacting ammonium sulfide with iron 3 chloride. So ammonium is another polyatomic group. It means <coughs> NH4 with a positive 1 charge. And let's see, we picked... Um, Oh, ammonium sulfide. So sulfide, IDE tells me it's probably an element. There's only a few exceptions to that. And the element that sounds like sulfide is sulfur. So I'm going to put an S there. On the periodic table, it says sulfur is a minus 2 charge. So I actually need to have... I'm going to clean that up. That looks good. not good. I actually need to have two ammonium ions stuck to the one sulfur to um, make a real compound. So, we're going to go up here, put parentheses around the ammonium, because I want two of the whole thing. And that will make the charges here cancel. If I have two ammonium, it cancels with the sulfide there. Um, so, ammonium's always soluble, so I'm going to write AQ. And then it says it's reacting with iron 3 chloride. So that's the brown stuff that we used in the very first experiment, the trace contamination experiment. And chlorine's um, usually soluble. It's only not soluble if you put it with silver, mercury, and lead. So we're gonna, and this is not one of those. So we're gonna make it aqueous. This is another double displacement reaction. So I'm gonna swap the cations. The NH4 is gonna match up with the Cl. And as it turns out, those charges already balance out. Ammonium is always soluble, so that'll be AQ. And then the iron is going to pair up with the sulfur. They don't have a change in charge because these are not redox reactions. They're not single displacement reactions. So I'm going to keep their charges the same, which means I have to have two iron and three sulfur. So each one of these is going to add up to a six total, which means they'll add up to zero when you put them together. Sulfide compounds are almost always solids. The only exceptions would be if we paired it with something that's always aqueous, like ammonium or anything from group one. All right, so that's that. Now, in the net ionic, I'm again, I'm breaking up everything that 
um, is ionic essentially. So NH4 is going to break off. It's a charged particle, so we're going to form two of those, and the sulfur breaks off. Same thing for the irons. There. Oh wait, I didn't balance it today. Oh, hang on. Wait, that was close. I caught myself because I said the irons, and I I have two iron on the right and only one on the left, and so that would have been wrong. So we got to balance first. So iron's a good place to start. I have two iron there, so or here. So I'm going to put two in front. Remember that when we're going back and forth on opposite sides of the arrow, we can only change the number in the front of molecule. We can't change the subscripts anymore. You can only change the subscripts to balance the charges. Uh, oh, I have two ammonium over here. Oh, but I need three sulfur actually. So really, I'm going to make that a three. So now I got six ammonium. Put a six there, which balances chlorine as well. So there, I think we're good there. Okay. Um, so now um, that two in front of the ammonium is is wrong because we have three times two now. We have six of those. And then three sulfurs, two iron. And for the chlorine, it's going to be two times three. So we got six chloride. Okay, and then over here, the ammonium is uh, aqueous, so we're going to break it up. And the six applies both to the ammonium and to the chlorine. It applies to the whole entire molecule. So when I break that up, I end up with six chlorine. But this iron is going to stay the same complex here because it's a solid. So I don't change anything. Solid, liquid, or gas stays exactly the way it was. And then I want to look for what's the same on both sides. Uh, ammonium is the same. Chlorine is the same. And that's it. So our net is going to be three sulfides plus two Fe3 plus to make Fe2S3 solid. Okay. Now we want to do enthalpy of reaction and indicate whether the reactions are endothermic or exothermic. Okay. So like I said, I'm only going to do the net equations here because th that's what's actually changing. I don't need all of the other details. That simplifies things a lot. If you try to find carbonate in the in the appendix, you can't find it, and it's really difficult to find it on the internet. Um, not impossible, it's just really hard to find a reliable value for it, because it's not very stable, which is why it decomposes. Um, so not being stable makes it hard to measure. So what I like to do, again, is just define the delta HFs that I'm using from the appendix. Again, that's chapter, th I mean, uh, that's appendix three that I'm looking at. Um, I'll try to bring it up here so hopefully you can see it in my screen. Sorry, I misspoke. I meant you can't find the value for carbonic acid in the appendix. You also can't find the value of carbonate in our um, book. So we need that here for the reactant. But you can find it on the internet. So all I did was Google. Here, I'll show you what I did. I just googled carbonate enthalpy and specifically I'm looking actually for the standard enthalpy of formation because that's exactly what the appendix C lists. And then um, I use the search function in my browser which I got to by typing control F. And there's only a few carbonate examples in here again because it's not very stable. You'll notice that it's not carbonic acid here. This is carbonate ion and barium carbonate and a few things that are solids. So they're easy to measure, or at least attainably measurable. Um, so here we have carbonate ion, and it has an enthalpy value listed of six seven, negative 675.23. And I do like to just double check and make sure that the, the units are the same as our book. So here we have kilojoules per mole which is exactly what our book does. Okay, that's where I go. There it is. So I'm going to use that value, and when I use another value f that's not in our textbook, of course, I told you guys, you got to cite it. And 
and I don't care how you cite it, just tell me where you got it from so I know. It's okay if you found a different value for this, but it's still got to be aqueous and it's still got to be carbonate ion and not like, you know, some other material. Um, when we use the appendix to look up the H plus value, um, it's going to be under hydrogen. Almost there. There we go. So hydrogen H plus aqueous has a, a value of zero, which is the same as the value of hydrogen, the element. So that's an interesting observation. They have the same heat. That's a very unique property of hydrogen. And then in wa in the case of water, we're going to go into the oxygen um, section. Okay. And this is liquid water, so we're going to pick negative 285.83. I don't have to cite these because we're using the textbook. That's kind of the default, I assume, that you're doing that. And it, but if you're going outside of our textbook, I do need to know where you got it. So I can look at it and make sure that you got the right numbers. CO2 gas is negative 393.5. Okay. So we're just sort of listing our variables here. I'm defining where they came from. This is important because if you pick the wrong numbers but you do all of the setup and the problem correctly, I can still give you credit as long as I can see which number goes to which thing. Okay? And so that's what you're doing here. If all you do is plug it right into Hess's law, then it's going to be very confusing for me, especially if you pick more than one wrong number, which happens all the time. So Hess's law is products minus reactants, just like final minus initial, because it's a delta, it's a change. So in particular, we like to say that it's the heat of formation of all of the products added up minus, so that means sum, right? So the heat of formation of all the reactants. So I just looked up the heats of formation for all this stuff, so we can plug it in. I'm going to do products first, because that's the formula, it's final minus initial. Um, and I gotta make sure that's balanced, which it is. So, negative 285, because the coefficients would come into my math here. In this case, it's really easy. I just add up my products, there's no coefficients, and my reactant is pretty straightforward. I, I use parentheses very, very intentionally and very, very carefully um, to make sure that I don't mess up this sign because if I do I'm going to get exactly the opposite like if if I mess that up I'm going to get an endothermic one when it was really the exothermic one okay so we've got to be kind of careful about it okay so this is going to boil down to negative 676.33 in the uh, for the products minus negative 675.23 so really I'm adding something there and so what we end up with is a very small change 1.1 kilojoules per mole here okay I'm going to go back to the prior slide if I can um, to do the same thing but with sulfur and iron these ones are pretty straightforward so if I look for sulfur it's going to be listed alphabetically Here's sulfur. Oh. Well, that's interesting. They took out sulfur ion and put S8 in. Oh, well, that's weird. Huh. So I guess the 13th edition has changes. Hmm. Okay, a quick internet search leads me to this enthalpy table from thoughtco.com. I have suspicions this may not be... Uh, okay, there we go. Alright, so... I don't know if you guys saw it or not, but I just got a battery warning. I fixed it. It's cool. So lots of surprises today. First they took sulfide out, and now batteries. Alright, so... Um, sulfide ion, according to this website, is plus 41.8, and that seems similar to what I recall from prior editions of our textbook. So I'm alright using it. Um, they do reference a book here, so that seems more um, reliable. 
than a website, which might not reference it. But the reason it makes me suspicious is this is a .com, and they have a nasty habit of being wrong. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and use this, but again, we're going to cover our bases by citing it. I forgot what it was already. 41.8. Okay, now from our appendix, we're going to be able to find iron 3 <coughs> plus. Okay, there it is. I want to pick the right one, so 47.69, negative 47.69. Also in the iron section is Fe. Are you kidding me? They took that out as well. Well, darn it. <coughs> but I don't remember seeing FES2, which is kind of interesting. That would be iron with a 4 plus charge. Something is wrong. I think that this is a typo. I think this is supposed to be FE3S2. I will reach out to the publisher, because FES2 doesn't make any sense. That would be a plus 4, and iron doesn't do that. At any rate... We can look on the internet and see if that value makes sense with that <coughs> info. Okay, yeah, I'm going to assume, and I, I might just look in my old version of this book, but I'm going to assume this was supposed to be FE3S2. I'm going to use negative 171.5. In, you know, if th this isn't going to be on your test, of course, but if it were, you should just say where you got things from. You should not use the internet during your test. That's not what I meant. But you can sort of do the best you can and you know you can write a little note and say I think this is the right value but if not you know at least I set up the problem right all right so again same thing delta H of products minus reactants so here we're gonna have negative uh, 171.5 minus the reactants which is 3 times 41.8 because this coefficient matters 3 times the value of each one plus the value of the iron So we're going to do inside the brackets first. Um, getting a little bit sloppy here. My iPad and my laptop is falling over. Okay. So we're going to... This negative 171 stays the same, obviously. There's no math to do there. But over here we're going to try to simplify inside of the brackets as much as we can before we do the subtraction. So what we get from doing this math is 30.02, and I, that's a positive number because 3 times 41.8 is positive, even though we're subtracting this negative number here. So when I subtract this, we're going to get a more negative number than what we started with in the products. So it's negative 201.52. Now, if you're wondering, I'm not really very strict about units and sig figs in the thermo chapter because these are all theoretical values and there's a whole lot of assumptions built into them anyway. So, being picky about significant figures doesn't really make very much sense. Okay? I'm really just looking for you to be able to follow the process and to choose the most logical things from an appendix, from a list, because this, these are the skill sets that are going to be useful to you in the future. Okay. So, for... Um, question two, I'm going to begin a new video, that way you don't have to watch the entire video if you've got, um, you know, the answer for this one.